in John 13. Let me ask you to turn there in a copy of God's Word, either from the Pew Bible or your own Bible. John chapter 13. I'll be reading the opening 17 verses. This is God's word. Let us give careful attention to its reading. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, tied it around his waist, then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I'm not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled he who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now, before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Thus ends the reading of God's holy and inspired word. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we sense that we are on very holy ground as we contemplate this upper room uh, experience before our Lord's crucifixion and death. Please give to me all due words to communicate clearly the importance of, of the teaching here. Give us all, O oh Lord, ears to hear, we pray and a will that will apply and remember this mighty picture of our Savior. It is in his name we pray. Amen. We started this sermon series on John chapters 13 through 17 last week, really just looking at the first verse. And it's, that first verse stands as something you might say of a title of an inscription over this whole segment of John's gospel. And it speaks to us about the love of the Savior. In other words, everything that's going to be said and done is going to be motivated by our Savior's love for his own. And that's still the issue here. So we're still talking about love here, but we're going to be picking up 
on, uh, you might say, characteristics of that love, characteristics, how, how it is described, and the two concepts that this sermon will revolve around from this text is the issue of sacrifice and the issue of exemplary love. That is a love that is to be imitated in our own lives. Let me set the history, uh, something of a historical setting here. You know the time. We've said that they are basically preparing for the Passover meal, the Last Supper. And so they're in this room and Jesus is there. And in that society, of course, it was common for there to be uh, the, the washing of feet. Obviously, in that society, sandals were common. And so, and roads were not paved. People walked. Uh, they didn't have cars, of course, things like that. So, so when you arrived at your destination, uh, often, of course, your feet were the dirtiest part of you. You may have taken a nice bath before coming to your guest place, but, uh, but your feet were dirty. And so it was customary, of course, for feet to be washed. But this was seen in society. Though it was something necessary, it was seen as a humiliating act to do. Jewish men would not, uh, peers basically would not wash one another's feet. They wouldn't do it. In other words, you, you kind of had a hierarchy. Uh, if, if you went over to my house, I would not wash your feet. Um, uh, you know, the, the ball might begin to roll downhill, so to speak. It might look, well, would Cecilia wash your feet? Well, no. Well, it, would one of my children wash my, your feet? No. In other words, whoever the lowest person in the setting was, basically, that would be the person that would, would wash feet. And hopefully in this society, it would be some type of Gentile slave. We don't even want to get a Jew's hands doing this. And yet it was customary. It was, but this is a lowly act. The only thing that, that comes to my mind, and I'm not going to try to, to, to be gross, but, but just trying to get a sense of what our Lord does here, uh, the only illustration that comes out of my uh, history, my life, is as a child, uh, my mother was one of 11, and uh, she was j just literally dirt poor. She was the daughter of, of sharecroppers in South Alabama. And uh, so now I grew up in Montgomery, Alabama, and so I grew up in the city and had running water and things, but we called it going to the country. We would go and visit um, my grandparents and relatives down in the South Alabama. And when you got there, the house was um, heated by, by wood and fireplaces. Things were cooked on a um, charcoal stove. There was a well out back and there was the outhouse. Now, in a society like that, at night you had, I'll, I'll call them chamber pots. And you know what they're used for. And like I said, I'm not trying to be gross, but as the night goes on, morning comes, who's going to empty them? What if that is your job? To go through the house, pick up the pots, and take them out to the outhouse. That's the kind of, of, of event we just read about. It was seen like that, this, this lowly task. And yet it was expected to be done. And so that leads to our first real point, sacrificial love. In light of that kind of historical and true understanding of the humbling nature of foot washing, now we see the sacrificial love of Christ. And we see it particularly, when I, when I talk about the sacrifice, in other words, we are saying that this is going to be costly love that the Lord shows. That's why you have the Lord speaking to Peter. Peter is such a wonderful character in, in the Gospels. Uh, the Lord has risen, taken off his outer garments, has taken up the basin and the towel, and he's going about washing feet. And Peter just wants, Peter recognizes this is not right. This should not be happening. It's interesting. He doesn't 
offer to take his place, but uh, it's, it's not right. And then the Lord says some things that, that, uh, that begin to be very important. He says that uh, if I don't wash you, you will not have a share in me. And you don't understand exactly, Peter, what's going on right now. You understand I'm washing feet, but it's really pointing to something greater. To say this um, action is costly, the Lord Jesus, you see, is heading to Calvary, where he's going to die that cruel death. That's what this is pointing to. It's something of an enacted parable of what it means. And we want, we want to understand this. Uh, we haven't taken the time, of course, to go through the earlier 12 chapters of John. But who is this bending the knee? John's gospel, the early points, are composed really of two, uh, two elements. There are the signs that Jesus does, and there are the I am statements. And so who is it that is bending the knee, taking a dirty foot? This is the one who healed the royal official's son in Capernaum in John 4. This is the one who healed the paralytic who had been paralyzed for like 38 years at the pool in Bethesda. This is the one who blessed the bread and broke it and fed 5,000 people. This is the one who heals the man blind from birth. This is the one who says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the true vine. And I'm on my knees with a basin and a towel, washing feet. And what is really interesting, you see, when we talk about this cost, see, the disciples, if they weren't, they should have been horribly embarrassed at this, at what our Lord does in humbling himself like this. But you see, even this is going to pale into insignificance. The cross will make the washing of the disciples' feet seem insignificant. The Lord Jesus is giving that picture of what he will do and accomplish for sins to be forgiven. And by the way, and, and that's, that's the importance of his words to Peter here. When we say sacrificial and costly, it, it is going to cost him his very life for you and for me, for our sins to be forgiven. And I know that that is an old story to you. I know you've heard it, but we want to see it freshly again in this event. And Jesus is claiming here to be the way for sins to be forgiven. He is the one. I must wash you if you are to be clean. There's another lesson here, of course, about how the dailiness of this. We, we said today the Lord's Prayer, and rightly so. Uh, that can be very much a daily prayer. Give us this day our daily bread, the prayer says, meaning that it is something to repeatedly say. And that's the point of Jesus' words here also when he says the one who's clean only needs to have his feet washed. He's, say, he's speaking of our need regularly, repeatedly to go on a daily basis and say, Lord, I am before you today still as someone who needs your grace. And thank God. He grants that. And so this is a sacrificial love that is here, a costly love. It is the picture of what is going to happen. But I want to press forward because this is an exemplary love. And I'm using that term, picking up on, on what Jesus says next in verses 12 through 17, where 
the washing is done. He resumes his place and he says, you call me Lord and teacher. And you are right to do that. I am your Lord. I am your teacher. I am your instructor, he's saying to them and to us. You're right to do that, to call me those things. In verse 15, I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. And then he gives the two illustrations. Who's the greater in the household, the servant or the master? Well, obviously, the master is the greater one. Well, if the master does this, surely the servant should also. And then the other, uh, the messenger and the one sent. Who's the greater? Well, it's the sending person. That's the greater one. And if that one is characterized by this kind of love, certainly the one sent is to be marked by that. Now, this is not a sacrament of the church. I'm not going to belabor that point. He says, do this. We're not talking so much, I think, about washing feet, but we are talking about what this kind of love reveals. It's a real recorded event of a humbling action of our Lord toward his people. And I just want to immediately go there. I told somebody this morning, I, I have, I don't know whether I say that uh, this, uh, I'm trying to think of what grips me. Is this passage in my grip or am I in its grip? I haven't been comfortable this whole week knowing I was coming to this text because I think I understand it mentally. But I don't, uh, it, it, it is literally astounding what is here. And let me just ask us all, Christians, you're here today professing faith in Christ. What is beneath you to do? What is beneath me to do? I think of a highly respected attorney in Asheville. I remember walking down the hall, and it was just a, one of those wonderful uh, scenes of contrast. Highly respected, very professional lawyer in office uh, in Asheville. There he is sitting on the floor of the nursery, playing with, with children in the nursery, caring for them during our church worship. I think of a, uh, a leading oncologist in Charlotte on a church work day, sitting on the floor with a tooth, uh, toothbrush scrubbing mold off the floor. And we could keep going on and on with illustrations, but I think that is a very important question. What is beneath you to do, particularly for another brother or sister in the Lord? The enemy of this kind of love is our status-seeking pride. My desire for status, my desire for image and reputation, all of those things can keep me from loving others as Jesus Christ loved this night and continues to love, by the way. By the way, you know what the disciples did that night? It's in Luke, Luke chapter 22. If you're taking notes, Luke 22, verses 20 through 27. So what's going on? Jesus has just done this. Somewhere in that evening, because Luke records it with his um, statements about the Lord's Supper, he said, Jesus is speaking and he says, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they begin to question one another which of them it would be who was going to do this. Who's going to betray them? Luke's next statement is, A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. 
And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. And he goes on. And he concludes that paragraph by this statement. Who is the greater, one who reclines at table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as one who serves. I'm among you as one who serves. Thank God, by the way, he still is. Oh, what a serving, compassionate Savior we have. But the point of the text is very clear. He's saying, be like me. Be like me. I will only just pass this point, but it is, uh, I think it is worth stating that he says in John 13, 17, uh, if you know these things, here's the key word, blessed are you if you do them. Blessed are you. This is a costly kind of love that we're talking about and, and not an easy type of life we're talking about to take up unsavory and, and sh perhaps shameful and humiliating actions. But it is what he did. And when the term blessed is used, I think basically at its heart, we're saying the smile of God is on that person, that this person is a person who is living in current fellowship with God, the experience of his covenant promises being fulfilled, blessed. That is to say, God is his God in actuality, in the experience, and, and that person is his person. It means having a right relationship with God and enjoying him as we should. It is through this path that we begin to experience that. Well, it starts with me. I had the occasion, kind of an interesting occasion. I was writing the letter just for, uh, Friday or Thursday, Thursday, excuse me, Thursday, and I wanted to get it in the mail. And I was writing to someone. If you compared us, you would say, "Well, Bill's the Bill's the more significant person in the church in uh, Coventry. He's the interim pastor. He's older. He's got more schooling, et cetera. This, that, and whatever." And I was writing to a, a young lady. Uh, and sending something in the mail, a member of this congregation. And I was wondering, so how do you end a letter like this? Well, I didn't want to just say love or something, didn't want to communicate. And then it's like the Holy Spirit taps me on the shoulder and says, hey, Bill, why don't you sign it your servant in Christ? And I thought, oh, well, that should be obvious. I'm sorry I was so dumb, Lord. Uh, but you see, doesn't this, doesn't it begin to flow like that with the elders? Don't we elders, talking to you, uh, eight men, nine men now, don't we need to hear this? Deacons, and I'm so thankful, I was, our deacons are such wonderful men. So to mention you specifically, is not to say that you're negligent, but it's just to hear it again. Your very name, deacon, is servant. And then each one of us, what would this principle mean for a husband loving his wife? What will it mean for a father loving his children? I'm not saying there's not authority structures and things like that and, uh, and such, Children are not going to be able to re remove the authority of a father from this. But what does it mean? What does it mean for church members to relate to one another? If we understand that we have that picture of basin and towel. We're going to move to uh, three successive actions that I hope implant this basic message. We're going to sing a hymn. It's a hymn that you don't know, probably. It's not a well-known hymn, but turn to hymn number 239. Turn to hymn number 239.
Hal was a Anglican, but I want you just to note what he did. Each stanza asked a question. Who is this so weak and helpless, child of lowly Hebrew maid, rudely in a stable sheltered, coldly in a manger laid, our Lord's incarnation? And then the second half of each stanza answers the question. He is, tis the Lord of all creation, who this wondrous path has trod. He is God from everlasting and to everlasting God. And then we're going to, and each stanza is that way, helping us to reflect. And it's going to be a very singable tune, I believe. I'll have uh, Barbara play it through completely for us. But then you're going to have an occasion using the language of our larger catechism questions to confess your faith in the insert that is here. And that too will remind us. And then we're going to go to the table. Why does this table exist? This table exists because of a savior, the savior of the basin and the towel. Let's, uh, let's play through the hymn.